Hey everybody, it's Adam with IHP, and we're here on episode 10 of JC Unplugged. We got JC and the rest of the staff. So, like always, we just get right into the questions. All right, Carlos, explain what trainers should be looking for when assessing rotation with and without the pivot. Uh, with the pivot, uh, it used to be the foot. We were looking for a T, but then we realized that we could get the T and not even turn the hips. Then we insisted on hip rotation, and we started noticing that if you turn the hip, you can steal it from the ankle, and you can steal it from the knee, and you look like that without rotating the hips. So now, what we're looking for is, basically, when we do the hip rotation, we do it nice and light, and what I'm looking for is just be able to transfer. Put one leg down and transfer the other. I don't even look at, at the rotation anymore. The way I get rotation now is I kind of get into a single leg balance, and then I turn the shoulders. Boom. And that keeps my knee and my foot aligned while I drive the hip into internal rotation with the shoulder. Here's your medicine ball, here's your cable, here's whatever, and then I just go to neutral. You know, you go in the hole, out of the hole. That's it. So that's how we are working on internal rotation as opposed to the way we, we did. Uh, when you're not rotating, basically all you're looking for is to be able to apply forces here, keep core stiffness, and in this case, you're of course rotating, but that applies to also lateral flexion, that applies to flies, which is rotation through the front. So, stiffness, be a period. The hips don't move, them, as we say. If you got change in your pocket, I don't want to hear it when you're, when you're moving. And on the other one, try to plant one leg and turn the hip while flexing it, and you'll feel it. You'll feel it a lot, and it's very easy, and you don't rotate the knee. Okay. Uh, question two. What approach or advice might you have when working with somebody who wants to spot reduce, spot reduction? Yeah, spot reduction is, is tough because people always want to reduce the area that they are genetically prone to store in. So if, if my uh, guy, normally it's the love handles, women's down here in the thigh. So they always want to go there. And I was them, by the time you get there, everything else is just shredded. It's tough because you're genetically predisposed to store it there. That's your genetic maker. Can you spot reduce? Out of this. Now, there's stuff you can buy. Uh, you, can, you can turn the fat like lid, but you're still going to have fatty acids in the blood. And if you don't, if you don't burn it up, it's just going to circulate and boom, deposit somewhere else. So I don't, you know, the old adage, uh, outside of other things available through either surgery, uh, and spot reduction uh, therapies like freezing and heat and all that, you're not going to go anywhere unless you like the suction. Sorry. Just so good old fashioned. Good old fashioned hard work and you're never going to just remove it from there. And probably you want it removed from the one place that will remove it last. It is what it is. Okay, someone uh, who is kind of thinking about becoming a personal trainer, what are some of the pros and cons that you would share with them about the industry and who might be the best people for that job, for a personal trainer job? So kind of a two-part question there. Yeah, who, um, what can they expect? Everybody thinks, you know, oh, I have a passion for exercise, I love exercise, and I love helping people. That's the same person that loves to eat, loves to cook, and wants to open up a restaurant. <laughs> Guaranteed to go back. Guaranteed. Those are the people that the big restaurant tours buy things 10 cents on the dollars from after they've blown their entire retirement, okay? So, I don't care how much passion you got, how much you like to help people, that's all great and nanny, but you need a certain personality for, for this. You're, you're, in the, you're in the people business. You're in the people business. If you cannot inspire and influence people to do good things like take care of themselves, you're out. I don't care what your degrees, what your certifications, what your skill set is, I don't care. Therefore, who makes the best personal trainers? Bartenders and waiters and waitresses. They know how to take a bad situation. Ooh, I spilled the soda on your lap. I gotta turn this thing into something positive or I'm not gonna get a, a tip. That person uh, doesn't like uh, whoever's running for president. You do. You can't come out and bang, bang. You gotta, you gotta massage that conversation. So you always have to turn a bad situation into a good situation. That is the key, the key characteristic of a personal trainer. Somebody comes in with a crappy day, you gotta say, you're in a safe spot, things are about to get awesome. Okay? You're here, everything's great. To the point where when they're having a bad day, you're the one they want to come and see. 
you know? So that's, that's a pre premier quality. Paper, paper, whether it's a four-year degree, or this certification, that certification, that is so low on my list, I can't even begin to tell you. That's below CPR. What certification do you have? Doesn't really matter. I, I look for a specific profile. Like the um, CO Team 6. Okay, those guys look for a profile, then they teach you how to shoot, and they teach you how to do all that. And the profile is you gotta be overfed, I mean, uh, underfed, overworked, underslept, and still be cool. You got that? Then we'll teach you how to blow up cars, jump from planes, and shoot things. So that's the same thing it is with, with, uh, with personal training. You have to be able to inspire and motivate people to take action. Not make them laugh. Not make them go wild. No. Make them take action to, to help themselves. What, uh, I guess, in, in, in from your perspective, what might be the differences or maybe what distinguishes agility from changes of direction? Oh, that's, you know, the SAQ thing has been a, more about semantics than really definitions. Quick changes of direction is this. Well, agility is your ability to manipulate your position in space or on, on forward, to change positions. Quickness, first step quickness or changes of direction is, changes of direction is first step, bang. Agility is the ability to get to in a position where you can take that first step. So for example, let's say that you're out of balance. Let's say you're here and you, and you fell down. Now you've got to get up and maneuver. But once you're here, changes of direction, that's pure power. Agility is what gets you into that position where you can just boom, operate on quickness. So speed is usually top end speed. Agility is getting into a position where you can use your quickness. If you're not in position, I don't care how quick you are, you, you can't pull the trigger on anything. You can't jump, you can't get to the ball, you, you can't even take your first step unless you're in position. Agility gets you into the position. Right. Now some of the things that, that I've, I've been reading lately talks about agility, there's, it's that, but there's a stimulus that you have to react to versus changes of direction are a lot of pre-planned movements. You already know, for example, um, I don't know, uh, like one of the things I read in baseball, they said it's rounding a base is a pre-planned movement. Mm -hmm. um, in football, you have a defender coming at you. There's a stimulus that you have to respond to there, and that becomes more agility. Sometimes, because anything, quickness, changes of direction, and agility could be self-governed, or it could be reactive. So, if you are going for a pass, or you're, uh, you're a defender, you go out, they throw the ball, and you fall down, okay? On your own, you have to get up. It's regardless of reaction, you're not reacting, you gotta get up and get back to the play. That's self up. Now, if you are running in one direction, and then all of a sudden, you see the play going in the other direction, and you have to change maneuver, that's a reaction response. So not everything is a reaction response. A lot of times it's reaction, voluntary. Reaction, self-government. Reaction, self-government. So you have both. You have reactive quickness, you have self-government quickness. Same thing with agility. Uh, what are your thoughts about the posterior tip and soleus helping to extend the knee during locomotion? What, what's, what's going on there? Yeah, I heard, I heard that one first time. Man, I don't even know, maybe 1990. 1994, Steve Plisk and Gary Gray were the first ones to throw that one out. I'm like, what? All right, so when you're walking, okay, say you take a step here, posterior tip is here, and so what happens is, let's say that you've already, you're already flat footed. Here, let me give you a little bit better angle on that. Boom, okay. Now, this leg is swinging over, okay? This is firm on the ground, okay? Everything is moving from the ground up at this point. This is your reference base. Posterior tip and soleus are here. I'm going to give you the explanation that Gary Gray gave me because he's really fun. So, so he goes, if you're in the calcaneus, all right, and you're sitting there, and the posterior tip and soleus are going over you, and they're holding onto the tibia, okay? They're pulling the tibia back or keeping the tibia from going forward. So they're, they're holding back. He goes, and while you're holding the tibia, pulling it back, what do you say to the butt? Because that's the way Gary Gray talks. Go, but go. So he's like holding on to the tibia and go, but go. So as this hip is moving forward, okay, this knee is extending. 
And that knee extension is not only helped by this momentum, but also by this posterior tip pulling back on that tip. So that's why they say posterior tip and soleus during locomotion, once the foot hits the ground, are, are uh, assisting in knee extension. It's the momentum of the hip going forward plus the deceleration of the anterior translation of the tibia that extends the knee. That's how, that's how that happens. But the first time you hear it, you're like, what? Yeah. It's pretty interesting stuff. And that's why a lot of, that's one of the reasons you see a lot of Achilles in tandem care. Too. Because it's so, it's such a hard, eccentric load all of a sudden, you know? This thing, it essentially, remember, that tick is going forward, forward, and all of a sudden, it gets a huge eccentric, and then it's a little concentric. Well, that's moving forward, and that is a huge load. Huge. And that's where it goes. Good nutrition question, which is segue into our seminar that we have this weekend. This weekend. Well, 11 to what two. is it? 11 to 2? 11 to 2. Yep, we're going to have a real good nutrition seminar. We're going to turn some of the simple stuff that everybody knows, like how many calories in a gram of fat, but we're going to tell you why that's so important. How complex that can get, and then at the end of the day, give you the simple explanation. At the end of the day, drink a glass of this, or you know, put a teaspoon back. That's the way we want to talk to everybody. But we're going to give you the, the good and plenty of everything. Right, but before I get into the question, it's $75 for a three-hour three yeah. lecture from you. Here and then Rio, what is it the, uh, on Facebook? Facebook, yeah, JC's Facebook. You can sign up at uh, ihpfit.com. ihpfit.com, JC's Facebook. Um, so we have spots here if you're local, 75 bucks for three hours. I don't think you can beat that at all. And I'm going to be giving you stuff that actually I've never lectured on. Uh, I do parts of it in the mentorship one on one when, I, when I'm with someone, and that uh, the mentorship is not cheap, it's $2,500 for a week. But when you get that kind of one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one with me, you get those those little tits of it, bits of information that you don't get, and we're going to be throwing a lot of that stuff out in that uh, in that center. So anyway, all right. So let's know. All right. What's the thermic effect of food, and why is it important? Okay. Thermic effect of food is the amount of energy that it takes to process food. Simple. Okay. Uh, fats they take the least amount. About three. 3% or so, some, depending on who you're being, 3 to 5, 0 to 5, whatever. Uh, veggies or carbs. Yeah, they can take anywhere between, let's say, 7 to give you 15%. Okay? 15 is probably more along the lines of broccoli, you know, cauliflower. 7 would be chickpeas and, and, and things that are starchy. All right? Then you have your proteins. And your proteins can take in the neighborhood of 20 to 30. Why such a range? Because depending on how much fat the protein has, the more fat it has, it tastes better if you have more of this in there. So if you have a, a nice fat, juicy, uh, what is it, uh, prime rib or something like that, that could be 20. If you have buffalo uh, that's highly, highly in, uh, lean, you could go close, close to 30. All right? And then you have whey protein, okay? which is 30 to 40. Also depending on your whey protein shapes, depending on what kind of protein, it, uh, what kind of whey it is, if is it mixed with sugar and whatnot. All right, why is this important? You'll find that the, the, the terrible foods are down have a lot of this. So they say that the American uh, diet, typical American diet is about 7% thermal. That means out of every 100 calories, you're using seven to digest and process, okay? We're talking talk about it this weekend. That's why it's important to have a lot of this stuff here. Okay, so if some inclusion of this, really, really high care uh, of adding a lot of this and keeping your stuff in here is going to give you, instead of seven, could give you maybe 20 to 15. So look, look at this. If you're at 7% and you're consuming 3,000 calories, okay, 7%, that's 200, 210 calories, okay? But if you're consuming 20, 600 calories, or 450 calories here, all right? Look at that. The difference is between 240 to uh, almost 400 calories. That's uh, walking, that's walking on a treadmill for an hour. So I always tell people, if I could tell you to eat a lot, so much that the problem would be consuming all this food. 
And on top of that, the type of food you're eating would cause you the same calorie output as an hour of walking on a treadmill. What do you do? Everybody says, yeah. So you give them this high thermic food, which is natural food, your berries and your uh, cruciferous vegetables, your lean meats, and supplement it with some two or three shakes of whey, and all of a sudden, you're burning, geez, you know, almost 20% uh, of your calories just from digestion. Add a little bit of exercise, and now you got yourself a nice, nice utilization. Not to mention that the, pro the nutrition density goes through the roof. So that's why the thermic effect of food, that's what it is, that's why it's important, and that's how it plays a huge role in, in dieting or in keeping your, your high, high volume, nutrition dense, calorie diluted meals, which is body building. That's why you can eat 10,000 calories and you see them eating all the time and they sweat a lot. Why? Because they're up in here, they're thermic. They're constantly burning, burning energy. That's what it is. Looking forward to that. More to come uh, this Saturday. Looking forward to that. All right, guys, we'll see you in a couple weeks. JC Unplugged, take care, have a great week. See you.